Thank you very much. So I'm very pleased to be presenting you the Bolero 1 TRIO 19 study. <coughs> By way of background, we know that trastuzumab, the anti-HER2 monoclonal antibody, has dramatically improved outcomes for patients diagnosed with HER2 positive breast cancer, both in the advanced and early stage settings. However, it's not a win for everyone. Uh, resistance to treatment still exists and remains a clinically unmet challenge, both de novo and acquired resistance. One pathway that's been implicated in resistance to these therapies is hyperactivation of the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway. mTOR inhibitors have been proposed to potentially reverse this resistance. Preclinically and phase one and two clinical trials have shown activity of the mTOR inhibitor Everolimus against HER2 <coughs> positive breast cancer. And most recently in the last year, the results of the Bolero 3 study were presented, which showed that using trastuzumab in combination with vinarelbine and Everolimus, an mTOR inhibitor, improved progression free survival with pa for patients with HER2 positive advanced breast cancer in the pretreated setting, so second, third line setting and beyond. Interestingly, in that study, there was an exploratory analysis that showed the subset of patients with hormone receptor negative disease appeared to have more of benefit from the use of Everolimus in that study. And so here is the design of our study. This was a 719 patient clinical trial. We enrolled patients from uh, 2009 through 2011. Patients were randomized in a two-to-one two fashion to receive paclitaxel plus trastuzumab with either Everolimus at a 10 milligram daily dose, which is different from the Bolero 3 study, which was five milligrams daily, versus placebo. Stratification factors are shown there. We had two primary endpoints, both overall survival, excuse me, progression-free survival by investigator assessment in the full population of patients, and then also progression-free survival in the hormone receptor negative subpopulation for the reasons I just described. The secondary endpoints are shown here. This is the progression-free survival by investigator assessment for the overall population. As you can see, there was no statistically significant difference between the two arms. Everolimus was associated with a 14.95 month median PFS and placebo 14.49 months. Now I'll show you the hormone receptor negative subpopulation and you can see a separation of the curves here with seven month improvement in favor of the Everolimus arm. However, this did not meet our pre-specified level of significance. We had set a pre-specified level of significance of P less than 0.0044 and the P value here was P 0.0049. So while these data are intriguing, they did not leave, lead to uh, show a uh, level of s significance. In terms of adverse event profile, this is very similar to that which was seen in the Bolero 3 study. We see more stomatitis in patients treated with Everolimus, more diarrhea in patients treated with Everolimus, as well as neutropenia and anemia. One thing I'd like to point out is that there were more on-treatment deaths related to adverse events in the Everolimus arm, 3.6% in the Everolimus arm compared to none in the placebo arm. We noted that these deaths, uh, all but one, occurred in the first 15 months of enrollment of this study and tended to occur in regions and sites that had little experience with Everolimus. Um, when these events occurred, the IDMC sent out a letter to all of the investigators uh, notifying them that very proactive, aggressive management of adverse events was necessary and only one death occurred subsequent to that. So this is underscoring the need for proactive, aggressive management of adverse events when combining Everolimus with chemotherapy. So, in conclusion, the PFS was not improved by Everolimus in the full population. In the hormone receptor negative subpopulation, there was an interesting seven month improvement in PFS that did not meet statistical significance. 
These data are consistent with the preliminary observation from the Bolero 3 study that the hormone receptor negative subpopulation of HER2 positive breast cancer may have a differential response to Everolimus, keeping in mind that neither of these studies utilized or allowed endocrine therapy for hormone receptor positive disease. Future studies and ongoing studies are evaluating the use of PI3 kinase pathway inhibitors in combination with trastuzumab and endocrine therapy for the hormone receptor positive subset. The safety profile was generally consistent with the known safety from Bolero 3. However, the increased rate of AE related on treatment events are notable and underscore our need to take the adverse event management very seriously. Thank you. Sarah, uh, um, I'm sure you're going to do it, although it's difficult to get tissues in some patients with metastatic disease, but one might anticipate that those patients that do benefit are those with P10 loss or P10 low or PI3 kinase mutations, which you would expect would not respond much at all to trastuzumab because the pathway is being activated downstream of that receptor. Um, do you have tissue and are you planning to do analysis of those markers as well? Yes. So we do have tissue from this study. Uh, in addition, tissue was collected from Bolero 3 um, and we're actually discussing combining the two uh, to increase the power um, of this analysis. They'll certainly need to be analyzed separately, but this was an exploratory analysis that was built into the protocol. So it may be that once you identify a subgroup, you'll see much more definitive or much more impressive results. I wonder if the ER negative subset, which has a little higher degree of P10 loss, that, that may be the explanation. It, it certainly might, yes. Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, Bruce Jansen, Oncology Report. For your pre-specified uh, subgroup analysis in the HR negative patients, you set the bar heroically high. Yes. What, what were you thinking? So. Um, the Bolero 3 results came out before we had accrued all of our PFS events. So before we had unblinded the study and knew the results, we amended the protocol to include this secondary, pri second primary endpoint. So the protocol was not built um, to do this from the get-go. Had we known there was going to be this signal with hormone receptor negative when we first built the protocol, we might have just done the study in hormone receptor negative or we might have um, enrolled more patients in that subset because we are so close to meeting our pre-specified level. The reason that we um, set the bar so high for that subset is that we wanted the alpha, the error rate, we wanted to heavily favor the full population so that we would not miss a signal in the full population. And so this was a, a statistical decision that was made, but certainly we're all, uh, you know, thinking about that and also thinking about whether future studies uh, should be planned in the hormone receptor subset um, themselves. Hi. Uh uh, Neil Osterwa with Medscape. Just could you um, elaborate on what some of the adverse events were that led to the deaths in, with Everolimus? Absolutely. So um, primarily pulmonary related events, pneumonitis, um, pneumonia. There was a cardiopulmonary arrest, which um, we weren't able to clarify more than that. Um, and I will be showing that later today as well, but um, they, they do um, appear to be, there does appear to be more that are related to lung-related events. Carolyn, Hel excuse me, Helwick Asco Post. How could you include hormone receptor positive patients in a study and not treat them with endocrine therapy? Um, can you raise your hand? I'm not sure who's, oh, there you go. I'm sorry? How many, how many were hormone receptor positive in your study and how can you treat, not use endocrine therapy on those patients? So um, I'll show you, I'll first answer the how many were hormone receptor negative and there was, um, there were 309 patients that were hormone receptor negative um, and so the rest were hormone receptor positive. Um, this is a good question, um, however, um, even though hormone receptor negative um, breast cancer, uh, hormone receptor positive breast cancer um, 
can be treated with HER2-targeted therapy and endocrine therapy. There have been several studies that have been done that show the PFS and response rate seen by combining these agents is relatively low. We have data from the TANDEM study as well as the EGF-3008 study also in the first-line setting, where response rates were, were quite low with uh, AI plus trastuzumab or AI plus uh, lipatinib. And so we felt it was ethical um, to use uh, chemotherapy, at least in the beginning, um, with the trastuzumab and everolimus. Now with our retrospectoscope on, um, I think, as I stated, ongoing studies and future studies are going to be analyzing, utilizing um, endocrine therapy with HER2-targeted therapy and PI3 kinase inhibitors in this setting. I think it's important to emphasize, too, that the patients also got chemotherapy here. Yes. And um, based on studies done with tamoxifen 20 years ago, which is probably not fair with newer agents today, we learned that it was not good to give tamoxifen along with chemotherapy, and therefore it was extrapolated all endocrine therapies should not be given at the same time as chemotherapy. I suspect that that's wrong, and there are trials, as Sarah said, going on right now looking at uh, adding endocrine therapy in ER-positive tumors. I think it's important because ER provides an immediate escape mechanism. If you don't block yes. it in a HER2-positive tumor, the estrogen receptor can start activating and sing signaling the cell to survive providing an escape mechanism. So it's a very important issue, but because chemotherapy was given and because of the, the uh, other reasons that Sarah mentioned, it wasn't incorporated in this particular study design. 